the Buddhist practice as a whole. It's the practice of learning how to take care of the mind. Because the mind is what shapes our lives. It has an impact not only on your own actions and experiences, but also on the experiences of other people. In other words, if you speak out of greed, anger, and delusion, or act out of greed, anger, and delusion, it's going to have a bad impact on other people. If you learn to speak out of a mind that's free from greed, anger, and delusion, that has a positive impact. So as you're training the mind, you're not the only person who benefits. Other people benefit as well. And looking after your mind is like looking after the body. The times when it has to work and times when it has to rest. We all know that the body needs exercise. But if you just exercise the body without resting it, without feeding it, the exercise is actually harmful. You have to know the body's strength, how much it can take, and also you have to know how to nourish it, how to let it rest and recover. In other words, you have to learn how to read the body. And the same principle applies to the mind. There are times when it has to work and times when it has to rest. And you have to know its strengths. Read its strength to see how much work you can make it do at any one time. When you live out in the world, there's, there's not only tasking, there's multitasking. The mind tends to work all the time. And on top of that, even when we rest, it's not necessarily the case that we're resting in a way that's really helpful for the mind. I'm going to stop and look at the TV, stop and read a, look at a movie. as a way of resting the mind, and sometimes you actually pick up more germs of greed, anger, and delusion. This is why an important aspect of training the mind is restraint of the senses. Because the way you look and listen and smell and taste and touch things can either be food for the mind or it can sap the mind's strength. So you have to be very careful when you're looking at something. Are you looking for the sake of lust? Are you looking for the sake of anger? If so, you're weakening the mind. And John Lee's images of the energy of the mind just leaking out the eyes and the ears and the nose and the tongue and the body. So when, when we're resting the mind, it actually saps its strength. So you have to be very careful. So if the mind is doing work, it's doing work that's really useful. And when it's resting, it really is resting in a nourishing way. This is why we practice concentration. Part of the practice is work, being mindful, being alert. That requires energy. In the beginning it's difficult because the mind wants to be doing all kinds of other things. You have to keep pulling it here, pulling it here. Keep reminding it, stay here all the time. You to compensate for that work. You direct your mind making the breath comfortable. So you have to evaluate. The evaluation is work. The directing of your thoughts is work. But as you get the knack for it, it begins to give you a sense of ease and well-being right here. That's the nourishment for the mind that you need when you rest. The Buddha talks about feeding on rapture. He talks about right concentration as food for the mind. This is where the mind gets to rest. As the mind is rested like this, then when it does have to work, it's got a lot more energy to work. And so you have to learn how to read it. How much work can you do? There's the work that the world imposes on you. And then there's also your volunteer work, which means anything you do just because you want to do it. 
you have to be very careful. Make sure you don't overwork yourself and that you learn how to read Okay, when the mind is getting overworked. In some cases, the work is something that really is necessary. You've got to do it because the world imposes it on you, which is why you need to develop as many reserves of strength as you can. But you also have to know how to pull yourself out of the work when it's getting too much for you. Then you have the choice of resting. Learn how to read those opportunities, because sometimes we miss them. We think that we have to do this, we have to do that, we have to throw ourselves into all the responsibilities of our lives all at once. And we miss the fact that many of these things are really not that necessary. The Buddha said that one of the signs of a wise person is you know what is your duty and what's not your duty, and focus on what your real duties are. The foolish person doesn't make that distinction and takes on a lot, a lot of duties that he or she doesn't really need to take on. And then you're sapping your strength. And the duties you really have get neglected. Or if you work at them, you don't have enough strength to give to them because the strength has been wasted away in other ways. So you have to have a clear sense in your life what's really necessary and what's not. This is one of the reasons why the Buddha has you reflect on death every day. When the sun goes down, this may be your last chance to see the sun. You may die tonight. Are you ready to go? If not, what work do you need to do? Of course, the work you need to do has to do with a mind, primarily. The same when the sun rises. This may be the last time you see the sunrise. You may die during the day. What needs to be done? What doesn't need to be done? This perspective helps you see what's really necessary in your life, what activities you take on that are necessary, and which ones are not. It's important to have this sense of how to sort through all the different things that life has to offer, which ones really are your duties and which ones are not. And that right there helps to clear away a lot of loads, unnecessary burdens. The other half of this, of course, is when you rest, knowing how genuinely to rest, so the mind really does regain its strength. A lot of the things we do for entertainment, as I said, actually sap the strength of the mind. They provoke more greed, more anger, more delusion. And when you're living in the monastery, it's easy to stay away from those things. Well, you'd be amazed how people can find ways of going back. But the general culture here, the general set of values, is to discourage that kind of entertainment, that kind of sapping of your strength. When you're away from the monastery, you have to have your own set of values really clear. And you also have to know how to deal diplomatically with other people when they start making demands that go against your real best interests. That's another set of skills you need to in order to manage your mind. You know your strength and to realize, okay, this is a point where I just have to say no. And learn how to say it in such a way that people don't get upset, don't get offended. So you can protect your practice. Because after all, this is what's really most important in your life, is maintaining the state of your mind. If you let the state of your mind start to disintegrate, you're not helping anybody at all, even if you do things to please them. The mind just gets dragged down more into greed, anger, and delusion. Its strengths, its strengths of its mindfulness, alertness, its conviction, its persistence, the traditional strengths, conviction, persistence, mindfulness, concentration, discernment, these get sapped away because you're not feeding the mind properly. Just using it, using it, using it. It's like a, an engine you keep running all the time. You never let it rest, and after all, the parts begin to wear out well before they have to. Use the engine only when you really need to, and then you let it rest otherwise. That way you can keep it for a long time. It can work for a long time. 
And when it starts showing signs of wear, you know how to fix it. We take better use of our, we take better care of the engines in our lives than we do of our own minds. That's, that's one of the ironies of modern life. We take care of better care of our bodies than we do of our minds. And it's good to take care of these things, but the mind has to have top priority, because everything else depends on that. If the mind is in bad shape, everything else gets useless, or can actually be harmful. When our strength is sapped in this way, how can we be helpful to other people? We actually become a burden on them. This is why it's important that you have to learn to read your own mind, to know where its strengths are, where its weaknesses are, what its limits are. And how you can nurture it properly. You have a sense of when to work, when not to work, how to work, how to rest. All of this is beneficial not only to you, to you but to the people around you. So our time spent here is not time that's wasted or selfish. For the sake of all our responsibilities, our responsibilities to ourselves and our responsibilities to others, you have to know how to take care of your mind. You have to give it time. Not only coming out on a retreat like this, but also learning how to keep it going, how to keep uh, keep checking the oil level and how to keep checking the transmission fluid and all the other little things that help keep the mind going, keep it operating well. throughout your life, not only when you're here practicing full-time, but also when you're looking for ways to keep the mind strong throughout every day, wherever you are. Now, these principles go against a lot of the values we have in everyday life, but they have to take priority, so you have to learn the skill of maintaining these values in the face of all of the other influences that there are out there. The first step lies in seeing how many of those influences really are from out there and how many are just your own unskillful ideas, own unskillful habits. Working on those first, and then learning how to deal with the influences that really do come from outside that you can't really say no to. Or at least you don't know yet how to say no to them. At least you learn how to ask for a little time out. Ask for a little space for yourself. Time for yourself. Almost every Ajahn in Thailand gets asked this question at one point. I don't have enough time to meditate in my life. How can I get any meditation done? And the answer, as always, is, do you have enough time to breathe? Well, yeah. If you didn't breathe, you'd die. Well, it's the same way with your meditation. You can be mindful throughout the day. You can be alert throughout the day. You can exercise your strain of the senses throughout the day. That in and of itself helps to strengthen the mind right there. That can be your practice. And then you have to learn how to make time for more formal practice. And the best way to make that time is to look at where you're wasting your time, taking on unnecessary responsibilities, or engaging in unskillful forms of rest. And replace that with more skillful rest, rest that actually nourishes the mind, replenishes the mind, so that whatever your genuine responsibilities are, you have the strength to see them through.